It's coming up. From the surprise hit film War Room, the athlete turned actor T.C. Stallings tells us about his next pursuit. I know I'm supposed to be here. I know I'm supposed to be here. Plus, after years under communist rule, without that challenge, there's no victory. The doors are opening in Cuba. What we have, we want to share with others. And the church is thriving. We can't stop until they come to the Lord. On today's 700 Club. Well, they said they were on a romantic date for 50 years. Ron Reagan and Nancy Reagan. And Nancy was one of the most influential first ladies in American history. She helped her husband become president, and uh, she stood by him with adoring glances after every speech he made. She was an amazing woman. I had the privilege of talking to her uh, to offer my help after, uh, you know, one of those uh, political uh, events. Uh, she, she was quite a person, but uh, tributes have been pouring in for Nancy Reagan, who died Sunday at the age of 94. Well, as Pat said, Ronald and Nancy Reagan had a love affair that spanned a half a century, from Hollywood to the governorship of California to the White House. And she took care of him as he suffered from Alzheimer's. Charlene Aaron brings us this look at the life of Nancy Reagan. Praise and respects for Nancy Reagan came from Republicans, as former California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger paid respect to the former first lady. She was one of the greatest first ladies, an extraordinary human being. And Democrats, as President Obama tweeted this photo saying, our former first lady redefined the role in her time here. Nancy Reagan will be laid to rest at the Reagan Presidential Library alongside her beloved late husband. Outside the library, families are leaving flowers for one of the country's most memorable and influential first ladies. Ronald and Nancy Reagan had a love story that spanned more than 50 years, with Nancy saying her only mission was to back her Ronnie and to strengthen his presidency. Nancy encouraged Ronald Reagan to run for the White House again in 1980, after his close loss to President Ford in 1976. He didn't want to try again, but she encouraged him, and he won in a landslide. And once they were in the White House, she kept an eye out for his best interests. She said, I'm a woman who loves her husband, and I make no apologies for looking out for his personal and political welfare. There was also controversy when Mrs. Reagan also turned to astrology during her time in the White House, using it in the president's schedule. She told Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show in 1989 why she did it. She thought it would protect her husband after the deadly assassination attempt in 1981 that nearly took his life. That all came out of the shooting. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't, you can't really describe what you go through uh, when your husband is shot and almost dies. And most people didn't know that. There were, there, were, uh, there were two times that they came to me and said they couldn't find his pulse. Um, he was very close to going into shock, and if he had, then that would have been it. She said it didn't affect any major decisions. In the final words of his last big speech, Reagan called on Nancy. Before I go, I would like to ask the person who has made my life's journey so meaningful, someone I have been so very proud of over the years, to join me. Nancy. After Ronald Reagan revealed in a public letter he had Alzheimer's disease in 1994, Nancy became even more the protector of his life and his legacy, calling it a, quote, long goodbye. When President Reagan died in 2004, Nancy planned his funeral. At his gravesite, this iconic image was taken of Mrs. Reagan kissing his coffin. Nancy also told ABC's Diane Sawyer something that Reverend Billy Graham told her about the promise of seeing the love of her life again in heaven. I just want you to tell me that when I go, that Ronnie's going to be there waiting for me. And he said, oh, yes, absolutely, Nancy. You are sure? <laughs> Billy says so. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, it's bittersweet. Uh, she's a wonderful lady, and uh, uh, it's sweet that her life was as it was. It's bitter that she's left. But uh, uh, 94, she's lived a good life. And 
The funeral was an extraordinary experience, and her love of her husband, even after she knew he was dying of Alzheimer's and had prepared for that death for years, nevertheless, she was still a grief-stricken widow, and uh, the images of that will live in our memory. Well, in other news, the battle for both the Republican and Democratic presidential nominations is far from over. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Here's John. That's right, Pat. Split decisions in both parties' primaries this past weekend. On the Republican side, Trump and Cruz winning most of the contests, and Bernie Sanders won a couple of primaries over frontrunner Hillary Clinton. Then the two Democratic candidates debated again in Michigan, and as Dale Hurd reports, some sparks were flying. In the land of General Motors, Hillary Clinton was playing to her audience. I voted to save the auto industry. He voted against the money that ended up saving the auto industry. If you are talking about the Wall Street bailout, where some of your friends destroyed this economy, you know, through, excuse me, I'm talking. The Democratic candidates met in Flint, Michigan. Michigan holds its primary election tomorrow with 147 Democratic delegates at stake. Voting will also take place in Mississippi and for Republicans in Hawaii and Idaho. Sanders and Clinton not only attacked each other, but laid it on the Republicans for some of their mudslinging. Compare the substance of this debate with what you saw on the Republican stage. We are, if elected president, going to invest a lot of money into mental health. And when you watch these Republican debates, you know why. Sanders notched wins in Nebraska and Kansas, while Clinton snagged Louisiana. On the Republican side, Super Saturday was Ted Cruz's biggest night yet. Record turnout handed him decisive wins in Kansas and Maine. Trump took Louisiana and Kentucky, but with Cruz close behind in second. That helped Cruz close the gap in delegates with Trump, and both men say they want the race now to be just between the two of them. I want Ted one-on-one, -on -one, okay? It has to be head-to-head. -head. Marco Rubio had a very, very bad night, and personally, I'd call for him to drop out of the race. Marco Rubio came back on Sunday to win Puerto Rico, and he's promising to stay in the race. Trump now has 384 delegates, and Cruz is not far behind at 300. Rubio is well back with 151, but he says he'll win his winner-take-all home state of Florida, while John Kasich says he'll win his winner-take-all home state of Ohio. So there looks to be no quick end in sight to the race for president for either party. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Pat, Dale seems right. It seems to be the never-ending campaign. Uh, it's uh, sadly that. I think we're all a little sick of what's going on, but nevertheless, uh, the Republicans may get it together, and I, I think if it's just Cruz and uh, Trump, they could have a substantive debate. It would be wonderful if they did. I would vote to stop all the debates and just get on with voting. But nevertheless, uh, Michigan's coming up. Uh, Trump looks like he's way ahead in the poll in that one. Kasich is hoping to pick up a win in Michigan. He's hoping to pick up a win in uh, Ohio. I think that's winners to take all. And um, then comes Florida, which again, winner take all. And uh, we don't quite know what's happened to uh, Rubio, but uh, he's he's long faded out. Uh, instead of, I don't know, he just, he flamed out in that one debate and he hasn't been able to get traction since. But it's a tough, long slog. And uh, I think we'll all be grateful when it's over. But. We still need a president, and that's what this is all about, is picking the leader of the free world. It's a big job. John. Pat, North Korea is threatening to launch nuclear strikes against South Korea and the United States as the two countries begin large-scale joint military exercises today. Last week, Kim Jong-un ordered nuclear commanders to be ready to launch at any moment after strict U.N. sanctions were slapped on Pyongyang for testing ballistic missiles. North Korea often makes dire warnings when the U.S. and South practice joint military drills. As Agency France Press points out, points out rather, the North does have a number of small nuclear weapons, but experts don't know if it's capable of putting them on nuclear missiles. Pat, back to you. Well, I certainly don't want to take a chance. It's terrible. You have a rogue state threatening to incinerate another state that's close by it or to incinerate a larger nation like the United States. 
They're talking about millions of people, and their disregard for human life is appalling. Uh, I don't know what we can do, but it has been suggested, and I, I totally concur. They are a puppet of China, and China needs to put the clamp on those people. That Kim Jong Un is a is a is a crazy kid um, who's got no business being in charge of any country, and. Um, we could squash them like a bug, and I'm not sure that maybe the time may come where we have to just for self-defense because it, it, it is a very dangerous thing to have a nuclear rogue state just running loose saying we're going to put our nuclear forces on alert. I mean, it's horrible to contemplate. John? Pat, former President Jimmy Carter says he no longer needs treatment for cancer less than seven months after revealing he had been diagnosed with melanoma that spread to his brain. The 91-year-old Carter shared the news with one of his regular Sunday classes at Maranatha Baptist Church in his hometown of Plains, Georgia. He said he received an MRI lasting more than two hours in a video posted on WXIA-TV and then went on to say, and then the doctors determined that I didn't need any more treatment. Israel appears to be developing some new alliances in spite of the dangers in the Middle East. As Chris Mitchell report, reports from Jerusalem, the development could mean good news for the Jewish state. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told visiting Jewish leaders from America a dramatic shift is happening in the Middle East. Major Arab countries are changing their view of Israel. Uh, that is that they don't see Israel anymore as their enemy but they see Israel as their ally, especially in the battle against militant Islam with its two fountainheads. The militant Islamists led by Iran and the militant Islamists led by Daesh. That new relationship was evident when major Jewish leaders from America met with the presidents of Turkey and Egypt. There's a wind of change in the region. I think there are new opportunities. Malcolm Honlight led the Jewish delegation to Cairo and Ankara. The difficulties and challenges of the region, terrorism, the ISIS threat, the role of Russia and Iran and others in the region are driving countries to reassess their relationships with Israel. And I think they've come to see that Israel has a lot to offer, whether it's the problems of water or agriculture or fighting terrorism. Honlight says Arab leaders told him the West has left a leadership void in the region as Arab countries face daunting challenges. Some of them see the absence of the West in the region and cite that, uh, feel that there's a vacuum and they're looking to, to find solutions within the region to some of these challenges and also seeing the involvement of Russia, which different countries see in different ways, but all express concern about what will happen with Iran post the deal with the influx of $100 billion. What role will they play in destabilizing the region? Honline says in the midst of these challenges, they see Israel as an ally. There are ways that we can be of help, and I think building relationships with Egypt, with other countries, with the Gulf, with Turkey, and helping move them in the right direction. Again, it won't be an instantaneous change. There are opportunities, though, to counter the extremist forces, because all of them see that they are endangered by it as well. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Pat, it reminds me of the adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. That's right. Well, I think uh, without question, the Saudis are coming to believe that the Israelis are their friends. And uh, they are threatened by Iran. And there's going to be a Shiite-Sunni uh, conflagration sooner or later, and it's going to blow up in the Middle East. And I still believe that those oil fields of uh, Saudi Arabia will be on fire. Uh, and set up probably by Shias. So the fact that they might reach out to Israel is understandable. And I, I have heard the back channels that the Saudis have indicated they would give assistance to the Israelis if they decided to go in and, and blow up some of the uh, uh, Iranian nuclear facilities. On the other thing, I think that Erdogan is uh, dangerous and uh, I believe that to count on them would go against prophecy, which indicates that in the latter days, there will be a coalition, including Turkey, that will come against Israel. Uh, but Egypt, on the other hand, al-Sisi should be regarded as a friend of the United States and a friend of Israel. And um, I think that the fact that we have been shunning al-Sisi in favor of the Muslim Brotherhood is one shocking failure 
of the Obama administration. Terry. Well, coming up, explosive church growth in an unlikely place. See why Christianity is thriving in communist Cuba after this. Well, strange things are happening, and I believe one of the prophetic signs in our day is what's happening in Cuba, because communism is fading in Cuba, which has been dominating that country for 50 years. And many people have wondered how strong was the church during those decades. Now they're learning that the church is amazingly strong and were they looking to see a spiritual revival in that island nation. On a typical Sunday morning in Cuba, you'll find church crowds overflowing around the island. Many are house churches meeting in remodeled living rooms. Others look like your typical church with one big difference, political restrictions. Space is an issue for so many Cuban churches. For this particular church, the government will not sell it more land, and it's growing, so it's been forced to build up. On the upper levels, you'll find Sunday school rooms plus four spillover areas to watch the Sunday service. When you have 80 to 100 people in an apartment, it's hard, very hard, and neighbors get upset. Pastor Miguel leads a house church now meeting in his yard because it no longer fits inside. It's a common theme in Cuban churches fueled by incredible growth and government restrictions. In the past 20 years, more than 16,000 evangelical churches have opened their doors. One of the things that has made us grow in faith has been the limitations and the difficulties. Pastor Nestor and his wife Rosa live in one room above their tiny church. On Sunday mornings and during weeknight services, only a few will have a real seat. People here don't care how comfortable they are. They could be exhausted from working all day and they will sit on a bag of rocks, a stitched up chair or stand the whole service and they're okay with that. Cuban church leaders say events led by the fall of the Soviet Union sparked the current church planting explosion. When the Russian government collapsed, Cuba went through a lot, and people started looking to churches for hope. At the same time, the government ended its atheistic philosophy and declared itself a secular state, leading an entire generation to question what it believed. A government official at the time suggested that churches, unable to obtain building permits, meet in homes. That offhand comment sparked a movement similar to early church growth in the Book of Acts. Pastor Francisco is one of thousands of Cuban house church pastors who followed the gospel with tremendous passion. We have evangelized everyone who lives in this area, a New Testament Bible to each home. We can't stop, we won't stop, because even if they won't accept the Lord the first, second, third or fourth time, even so, we can't stop until they come to the Lord. The growth of the church here is even more miraculous given the country's poverty. Average monthly government salary is $20, and professionals typically make less than 50. Still, Cuban churches are known for their generosity and willingness to sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. What we have, we want to share with others. What we have, not what we have left over. Another obstacle Cuban churches face is spiritual warfare in the form of Santeria, it's a blend of West African religions known for its ritual ceremonies. This is a wooded area in Havana where those practicing Santeria like to come. They will perform ritual cleansings in the river here and offer sacrifices on this rock. Pastor Nestor faces resistance right in the neighborhood. During one Sunday worship, a Santeria group stood outside the church beating their drums. Levantamos la iglesia todo en oración. It was kind of like a spiritual face-off. The church just started praying, and then we prayed for rain, and all of a sudden there was thunder, so they had to leave. 
Church leaders say they're enjoying a new season of relaxed restrictions. It's easier to evangelize outside the church, and they receive more permits to hold special events. Still, most churches cannot expand or buy land. They cannot produce Christian radio or television shows. And they must work around a dysfunctional economy. Remodeling plans at Pastor Nestor's church are on hold indefinitely until they can obtain much needed cement. Sometimes without suffering, there's no challenge. And without that challenge, there's no victory. Reporting in Havana, Cuba, Heather Sells, CBN News. Thanks, Heather. That is a fabulous report. And it encourages all of us. I think, ladies and gentlemen, that's a prophetic sign. I really do. I think that uh, when communism falls as it is in Cuba and the church moves forward, you'll have a revival all over the Western Hemisphere that will be of tremendous Im impact uh, on the lives of the world. And I, I think this is a is a sign, if you will, of the second coming of Jesus Christ. It is a major, major breakthrough. And I think uh, I congratulate those pastors in Cuba. They've suffered, they have endured, and they've been courageous, and now they're coming forth in victory. So I'm, I'm thrilled, and we ought to all be to pray for them. Terry? Well, up next, a doctor tells his patient that she needs surgery for a torn rotator cuff. And I said, do I need surgery, doctor, if I can go like this, if I can go like this, like this? His jaw just dropped. Find out what the doctor does next and see how this woman is supernaturally healed when we come back. To see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com. Sally Cox was in tremendous shoulder pain. Her orthopedist, uh, orthopedist suspected she had torn her rotator cuff, so he scheduled an MRI. While Sally was waiting the results of the MRI, a miracle happened. In December 2013, Sally Cox was carrying a handful of candles in from the garage. But when a couple of them fell and she reached out to catch them, she heard something snap. I grabbed my arm and I was in pain. I was in so much pain, I was crying. I called my daughter and I told her, please come now. I said, I have to go to the doctor. I have an emergency. The doctor treated Sally for pain and referred her to an orthopedist. The orthopedic doctor told me that I might have a rotator cuff tear and that he would schedule an MRI. Sally did her best to live with the pain. Then, a few days before her scheduled appointment to get the MRI results, she sat down to watch the 700 Club. Toward the end, they start praying for people who have certain ailments. This is a shoulder uh, situation. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's the deltoid muscle or uh, it's the rotator, but whatever it is right now, just touch your, your, your shoulder. In the name of Jesus, there's fire. You'll feel fire going through that, that joint, and you are healed in Jesus' name. I grabbed my shoulder, and I said, that's for me. Lord, that's for me. And I just held on to my shoulder. I felt warmth, and I thought, oh, Jesus, I just know that you can heal. And I said, I praise you, Lord, and I claim the word. Sally began to feel a difference the very next day. I started feeling that I could lift my arm. So I went like this and I was doing this and, and it dawned on me, wait a minute, you're using your arm and you have no pain. And I called my daughter immediately and I said, I could use my arm. Jesus did it. I said, Jesus healed me. Two days later, Sally met with her orthopedist. The MRI confirmed she had torn her rotator cuff and would need surgery. I said, do I need surgery, doctor, if I can go like this? If I can go like this, like this? His jaw just dropped and he said, I guess not. And I said, do you believe in God? And he said, 
Yes, I said, he did this. He healed me. Sally is pain-free and has had full use of her arm ever since. She encourages others to believe God for healing. Believe in your heart that the Lord can do it. He is the great healer. What a miracle. If you know somebody who's had rotator cuff problems, you know that is a miracle. It's a tremendous miracle. It's Unbelievable. A, it's a huge thing. But anyhow, you know, I didn't know Sally. Mm -mm. You didn't know Sally. She's a sweet lady. She's got a beautiful spirit. But we didn't know her. But God knew her. Saw her there in the middle of all the millions of people in this country. Saw her, reached down, touched her. Yes. And suddenly a miracle took place. Unbelievable. All right, we've got a Here's couple Here's another others. one. Yeah. This is Rosa. Yeah. She lives in San Marcos, Texas. She was experiencing severe abdominal pain since December of 2014. She was diagnosed with mild gastritis and a hiatal hernia, and her doctor prescribed two types of medicine for treatment. Neither would relieve her pain. She was on a very strict diet, no acidic foods. Last month, she was praying for a healing and asked the Lord to show her a sign. So the next morning, she and her husband were watching this program. And Pat, you said, acid reflux completely healed in the name of Jesus. And then a hiatal hernia is being healed in Jesus' name. Take it. Upon hearing you, Rosa said, that's me, that's me. She was immediately healed of the pain. She can eat anything she wants now. You know, how did God create the earth? He did it by speaking. He spoke, let there be light. Let there be planets. Let there be a sun and a moon. And as he spoke, things came to be. That's the way this works. When we speak the word, it brings forth power. And the power brings forth healing. Don't ask me how it works. That's not for me to know or say. All I can know is that God Almighty, this is how he organizes the world. A man shall eat good by the fruit of his lips. That's what it says in the Bible. Now, Terry and I are going to join hands together, and we're going to pray for you. And I want you to pray for, with us. And I want you, in a sense, to speak to that which is hurting you. And as we get together, and Terry joins with me, Father, in Jesus' name. There's somebody... Uh, You've been crushed. It's like a, a side of you, like like your ribs or something. You've been crushed. I don't know whether a vehicle rolled over you or, or what happened, but there's a crushing. And right now, all that is is restored. Uh, your lungs will fill out again, and those ribs are are healed in Jesus' name. What, what do you have, Terry? Someone else, you have excruciating headaches. I, I don't know if they'd be diagnosed as migraines, but you'll know it's you. The pain is like right behind your eyes, and it just almost makes you feel like your eyes are throbbing when you have this, and it's recurring. God is healing that right now. The pain is gone, and you'll not have them again. Um, so you had a chip on your pelvic girdle. It was an accident of some kind, and a chip, a little chip of the bone is loose. You may have even had a, a MRI or X-ray to show it, but right now that little chip is joining back together with the bone, and it is healed in Jesus' name. The pain is gone. Mm -hmm. Touch. There's someone else. You have a muscle disease. I don't know the name of it, but it has something to do with enzymes in your system. God is regulating your system for you creatively all over again, Thank and you, it's going to go away in Jesus' name. Receive it. Uh, an infection is throughout the body of several people. Uh, it's not a MRSA, but it's like that. In Jesus' name, God is healing you. And that infection is leaving. The inflammation is leaving. In the name of Jesus, mm -hmm. touch. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Wherever you are, let us pray for you. We'd be delighted to pray. We've got people at the phones that pray. They're here 24 hours a day. They'll pray for you. You can call in and say, look, I, I just want you to pray for me. So it's 1-800-759-0700. Somebody's here. And uh, you tell us what God has done. I know some miracles are taking place right now. Terry? Well, still ahead, the breakout star of War Room, T.C. Stallings, is going to talk about his role as Tony Jordan and the real-life pursuit of his God-given purpose.
Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. The faith-based film Risen remained in the top 10 in its third week in release. It brought in an estimated box office of just under $4 million for a total of $28 million. It finished number two, uh, sorry, it fi finished number six for the weekend. Risen tells the story of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus through the eyes of an unbelieving Roman military officer played by actor Joseph Fiennes on a mission to find the body of Christ. Well, CBN's Orphan's Promise has given special training to missionaries and pastors in Ukraine. Orphan's Promise helps ministers who work with children and teens living in conflict zones. One pastor explained what it's like to serve on the front line, saying, There are many children living here, and we realize that we, as a church, can serve them. And we understand that it's necessary to train our teams on how best to meet their needs. The five-day training provides practical and theoretical guidelines for working with children growing up in a war zone. Each team that attended also received a complete season of Superbook and the accompanying church curriculum so they can start their own Superbook clubs. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to CBN.com slash international. Pat and Terry will be back right after this. The movie War Room was produced on a $3 million budget and made more than $67 million. It also made the lead actor who played Tony Jordan a star. Take a look. T.C. Stallings is a professional athlete turned actor. You may remember him from his role as T.J. in the Kendrick Brothers film, Courageous. Three years later, T.C.'s career reached new heights with his breakout performance as Tony Jordan in the 2015 faith-based film War Room, which soared to number one in the box office in its second week. In his first book, The Pursuit, TC shares how he has courageously pursued God's purpose for his life, even when it wasn't easy. He wants to equip and encourage you to do the same. Well, please welcome to the 700 Club, T.C. Stallings. It's great to have you with us. Great to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, what was your reaction, T.C., when you were offered the role of Tony Jordan in War Room? Well, um, actually, I was I was kind of intimidated by the role, to be quite honest, for a lot of different reasons. You know, this was, you know, Alex and Steven's first venture out, you know, starting their own company, and uh, it was a really in-depth role. It was more material than I ever had to work with. Um, Tony Jordan had so many uh, emotions that he had to go through, yes. and it was quite an undertaking. But yeah. I know Alex and Steven, they pray about absolutely everything, yeah. and so when they told me that you're our choice, <laughs> then I knew that I was God's choice. You yeah. really, really were able to touch some emotion that for a lot of guys needed to be touched in that movie. Was that hard for you? Um, well, there are a lot of areas, um, mainly one, ambition, in which I identify with yeah. Tony Jordan. You take ambition and your drive and you, you lead it by your human nature as opposed mm -hmm. to letting the Lord lead it. You will railroad everything else, and you don't want anything to get in the way of your dreams, goals, and desires. I identify with Tony Jordan because with football, that's how I was. Um, but when I traded in um, my will for God's will, it was humbling, and it broke me down. And so I kind of just drew from that. You go to that place in your heart and in your life and yeah, refer I, to that. Yeah, you just draw from that, and then you go for it. And uh, But, yeah, I just prayed before every scene and told the Lord, give me every emotion I need to have, and uh, we'll just go from there. Well, that prayer was answered. <laughs> Were you surprised that the movie was as successful as it was, or did you know it was going to be a hit from the get-go? Um, number one, no. I, I didn't think that it would do that well and yeah. be that huge. Um, I remember at the Atlanta premiere, we were talking like, hey, let's just look at this as a fan. What do y'all think it's going to do? And we were talking about <laughs> top three would be great and so on. But number one, no, it's just mind blowing. Um, it was powerful. Yeah. It was powerful. I mean, it presented a message and it resonated with people. In your own life, acting wasn't your number one desire. Talk, you mentioned football. Talk a little bit about what God had to do in your heart and life to get you on the track he wanted you on. Um, yeah, as a kid, 12 years old, you know, I'm watching Barry Sanders um, play football. And I said, <laughs> I want to be Barry Sanders. And uh, it was a means to get to college, and uh, it brought me a lot of joys. And I used to attribute a lot of my success to football. And football was pretty much God for me, and that was the problem. Uh, you know, <laughs> For all of us. <laughs> yeah, you know, you have that thing you want. And so, I, you know, I played and, and uh, you know, for, for six and a half, seven years, you know, I played mm -hmm. in every league you can imagine, but I never got to the NFL. But that was my number one pursuit. Um, but in, uh, in 2008, um, after my last year over in Europe, I go and see Fireproof. 
And, uh, and I watched people in that theater start crying and talk about fixing their marriages. And I'm like, wow, this movie is changing people? And I said, well, man, I, that, that's what I want to do. And I said, who made this film? And my wife said, the Kendrick Brothers. I said, well, we got to start praying about working with the Kendrick Brothers. <laughs> and a couple of years later, I'm working with the Kendrick Brothers. Yeah, so. <laughs> and it, was, it was a journey. And you know, it's pursuing the things that God puts on our heart. You know, you can begin to do that, but there are ups and downs and sometimes roadblocks along along the way. I, we only have a little bit of time left, so I want to mention your book. Because <laughs> it's you pretty freshly out the pursuit. Uh, you know, you have you do have a passion to give people something, something meaty to chew on, and you've yeah. done it in this book. You say 14 ways in 14 days to passionately seek God's purpose for your life. What do you want people to get out of this? Well, I want people, especially um, number one believers, people who believe Scripture, because yeah. uh, I looked at Psalms 139.16, and it says, I saw you before you were born. Yeah. Every day of your life was recorded in my book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. And so I looked at that, and I said, what does that say about my next few weeks, next few months, next few years, that the Lord has it all planned out? And here I am doing what I want to do uh, when the Lord already had a plan. So I'm encouraging people to trade in your will yeah. for what God wants you to do. You know, there's a cliche in the world. You can be anything you want to be. But no, Christians should want to be what God designed them to be. Everybody yeah. should want to be what God designed them to be. And when you look at that scripture, you got to decide if you believe what that says. And if so, then now, hey, like I'm an actor and I, and I follow a script and I act yeah. it out. Well, you know, the Lord is the, is the writer and the producer of your life. And you're just supposed to, you know, ask him, what did he write? You know, like, what is the script of my life? And then you live out the pages. Yeah. And even my pain makes sense when I'm living out my purpose. And, uh, and I want and I want to see people uh, pursue their purpose. I don't want to see people confused and hurt by life um, when the Lord may not have written it that way. It's mm -hmm. just you pursuing what you want to do. And so when people ask me how I made it, um, this book is, a, is it tells my story and the scriptures that should encourage a person as you read them to pursue your purpose. Um, because uh, it's a blessed pursuit. Amen. What's next for you? Oh, man. You know, um, I'm continuing to read scripts and I'm continuing to um, just do what, what the Lord asked me to do but right now. He's got me going around the country, just continuing to tell people my story about pursuing him. And I'm connecting people with Jesus and I'm enjoying doing it. Uh, I've been in a few commercials. I continue to do that. Um, but just taking my family around the country with me, traveling, speaking, um, and taking the, the next script that the Lord tells me to take. Yeah. And the moment he says you're done, I'm done, and I'll do it with the next thing that yeah. he tells me to do. Well, your story is just a small part of what's in TC's book called The Pursuit. It includes this story and also 14 scriptures and chapters to help you discover God's purpose for your life. He's not just about telling you about his life story. He wants you to have one of your own. And so get a hold of it. It's sold wherever books are available throughout the country. And I think it'll be a real blessing to you. Thank you. Thank Great you. Great to have you here. We'll watch for you. Absolutely. <laughs> Pray for me. <laughs> Will do. We'll be right back with more of the 700 Club after this. Coming up later, We'll bring it on with your email questions, so don't go away. Rachel was a 10-year-old with an attitude. She only wanted to please herself. And then one day, all that changed after Rachel saw an episode of Superbook. Like many children, 10-year-old Rachel had a hard time obeying her mom. In fact, it was becoming quite a problem at home. I often asked Rachel for help with the chores, but she never listened to me. I felt like she was rejecting her sister and me. It made me feel very sad. I didn't care about helping anyone. I didn't want to share anything with my sister. I would rather have fun with my friends than stay home to help my mom. Then a village pastor invited Rachel and some kids to the church to watch the classic edition of CBN's Superbook program about the Good Samaritan. I like the Good Samaritan. He helped the man who was robbed and hurt. He had a lot of love in his heart. I wanted to be like him. At the end of that program, Rachel prayed to become a Christian. I learned that Jesus loves me and he died for all my sins. I put my trust in him. I felt so happy. 
She also began to think about ways that she could be a good Samaritan too. I should not be selfish. I should do good things for other people and help those in need. Back home, Rachel put those ideas into action and her mom noticed right away. Rachel showed love for her family. She started helping me with the housework. When I got sick, she took care of me and prayed for me. Rachel told her parents what she had learned about Jesus and the Good Samaritan. Then she prayed with them, and they became Christians too. Now the whole family goes to church together. Rachel and her sister now invite all the neighborhood kids to come and watch CBN's new reimagined version of Superbook, which is airing in the Khmer language across Cambodia. Because of Superbook, my parents, my sister, and friends all received Jesus as their Savior. I am so happy that God helped me to love others and change my life. Thank you, CBN, for Superbook. What happened to Rachel is happening to children all around the world. Superbook, the stories of the Bible, accurately told are touching the lives of children and nations that you and I will never have a chance to visit personally, but Superbook is there and it's being translated into all those languages so they hear it in the language of their heart. Listen, when you join the Superbook DVD Club every four to six weeks, you're gonna receive three copies of the newest episode of Superbook for your recurring gift of $25 on your credit or debit card. And we've got something special for you for Easter. It's an Easter bonus. New members of the Superbook DVD Club are going to receive three copies of our newest episode, David and Saul, plus two free Superbook DVDs. One copy will be of The Last Supper and one copy of He Is Risen. And it's all for just $25. You can't beat that. DVD Club members also receive free streaming of both season one and season two episodes. So literally your kids, your grandkids, your neighbor kids can enjoy Superbook wherever they go. You want to be a part of this because it's a wonderful opportunity for kids to get the gospel message and to receive it deeply into their hearts. You saw Re Rachel's attitude change that's not unusual from children that we know that have been watching Superbook. If you'd like to be a part of this, call 1-800-759-0700 or you can join by logging on to cbn.com. But join now. We want you to know not only will you get your Superbook copy of David and Saul plus the two extra specials for Easter, but your gift goes right into making this available to children mm. around the world. So you really doing something special. Mm. Pat? Terry, we're, we're thrilled with the impact of Superbook. It's just beyond belief, ladies and gentlemen. You figure probably half of the people in the world are under 18, and uh, we're out there reaching that group, and there are just uh, billions of people uh, that are responding to Superbook. Absolutely. So it's there. Well, up next, we've got your email questions. Ed says, quote, if we come to the Lord and ask forgiveness, Will, he, will we still reap what we have sown if it's something bad? <laughs> A lot of people have that question, Ed. I'll give you an answer after we come back. Time to bring it on with your email questions. This first one is from Ed. The Bible says we reap what we sow, good or bad. If we come to the Lord and ask forgiveness and have our sins washed away, will we still reap what we've sown if it's something bad, or will that be forgiven also? Uh, Ed, let's assume, for instance, that uh, uh, you've been immoral and uh, you have uh, sired a child out of wedlock and you're ashamed of it. And so you come to the Lord and say, God, I had sex out of wedlock, and I have sired a child, and I'm sorry. I ask you to please forgive me. And the Lord will say, Ed, I forgive you. Your sins are washed away. But what happens to the child? God doesn't wash that child away. You've still got to take care of the kid. Uh, he's your responsibility. And uh, what you did is going to have to have consequences, and you may have to be paying for that the rest of your life. Uh, so the answer is that the eternal consequences will be forgiven. The temporal consequences you may have to work through. Uh, how much you have to work them through, I don't know. For example, if you're a glutton, he'll forgive you for gluttony, but you may have to spend a lot of time dieting to get rid of 100 pounds. You know, that's the way it goes. So. 
he will not take away all those temporal problems that you have caused by your, by your actions. All right? Okay, this is Elizabeth who says, I was told today that my seven-year-old son must repeat his second grade class. As a mother, it breaks my heart. It's an issue that I've been praying about ever since I noticed his slowness in learning, but accepting it is really difficult. Even at this moment, I'm trusting God to help me identify his potential and to accept him the way God created him. Please advise me on how to pray for my son. Well, pray that there'll be an uh, influx of God's wisdom. And, you know, work with that boy. You just never can tell if there's something might unlock. If you get somebody that all of a sudden learning, you know, there's a huge potential. And he hasn't hit his potential. Even if he's a slow learner, he still hasn't hit his potential. And if you work hard enough, begin to get other things involved. For example, with reading, we did a program called Sing, Spell, Read, and Write. We had people singing songs, singing words, singing the ABCs. And effective. their, their uh, learning curve just was dramatic. The same thing with your son. So get some special training and spend time, a lot of time working on it. Mm -hmm. And something might turn. Okay? Yeah. This is Ruth Pat who says, how often should communion be served in church? My pastor believes it can be too often, so we receive communion only four times a year. I choose to take it every day at home. Am I wrong or is it a personal choice? Um, I really think you are. I think it's an important sacrament of, uh, of the church, but uh, I, I just think having every day you, you, you say something is communion, just you, you know, in the kitchen, I, I think you cheapen the sacrament. I, I, I don't think four times. I mean, there's no r rule in the Bible uh, you know, of how often you do this, but nevertheless, it ought to be something that is set apart as something sacred. It's like baptism. You don't baptize somebody every day. Well, he got baptized. Well, let's do it again and again and again. I mean, you don't do that. So I think the same thing with communion. Uh, we show forth the Lord's death till he comes back again. So it's a very important, sacred thing. But, uh, you know, there's no rule in the Bible how often. All right. This is a viewer who says, our children are 20, 19, and 16. They keep arguing with us about not letting them watch movies that we believe are not good for any age because they include swearing, nudity, and extreme towel or violence. We've committed ourselves not to watch those either. Our kids say that by their age, they should have the opportunity to choose what to watch and decide if it's right or wrong. Our kids still live with us. Are we being too harsh on them? Well, I think not. The Bible says uh, I, I have will not set my eyes on any unclean thing. Uh, it's so easy with so much out there that's, uh, uh, you know, all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff. Uh, listen, if they're living in your house and it's your TV, uh, you can tell them if they want to buy their own TV, then, you know, <laughs> they can go, go, for it. You go for it. But uh, <laughs> they want to use your TV to watch stuff that you consider is salacious. But it's very hard to watch anything anymore. They used to have a PG rating. That could be pretty violent. Uh, you know, there was one movie that uh, some friends of mine said, we don't want to have any R-rated movie, and we want to go to something that's PG. So we went to PG, and here uh, one of the featured things is a naked lady getting, uh, you know, her, you know, drawn by an artist. And so I said, okay, hey, that, that's great. That PG stuff is something else. So yeah, it's not, I, 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 not I, easy to stand it, by that it, standard. It really isn't. I mean, you don't know anymore. But uh, okay. Well, that's all the time we've got. But thanks so much for your questions. Thank you for being with us. And uh, you have a great day. Well, we leave you with today's power minute. It's taken from Ephesians. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Well, tomorrow, we've got a former bachelorette, Emily Maynard. She's going to say how she got real love despite all the hype on that so-called reality show. But for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thanks for being with us, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.